Welcome back to Vox Podcast, the weekly pseudo-intellectual pop culture podcast with drinking and swearing. My name is not Chris Maverick, so please do not call me Mav. Uh, this is Wayne. Mav is, in a rare case, not here this week. Uh, I am joined by our other co-host, Katya. Hey, Katya, how you doing? I'm doing all right. You know, hanging as we are yeah. all in lockdown. Yeah, yeah, same old, same old. Yeah. Um, so, so this is... We are so used to Mav sort of guiding us here in some ways, which is scary that uh, you know, we allow Mav to guide us in anything. But um, it is truly misguided. It's really misguided on our part, and, and we're all well. You know, that's a whole other podcast, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> following Maybe for Mav's birthday next year. Following authoritarian leadership is, you know, never a good thing. Um, <laughs> anyway, we're uh, we have another conversation today. We have a couple of guests we'll get to introducing. But Katya, this this episode was uh, your idea. Why don't you you lead us into yeah. it? Yeah, as as folks, regular listeners would know, uh, the episodes that Mav generally is not on are the game ones because Mav does not play video games or RPGs or really anything of the kind. Um, followers of our blog will know that we posted a while back uh, about the new Wizards of the Coast announcement that they're retooling how race is represented in D&D. And as always, this show has some capital T thoughts about that. So we brought some D&D, fellow D&D players. Um, I myself have been playing for five years. Wayne, I believe you also have played um, on and off for quite some time. I, uh, I got a box set from a hobby store in a mall in like 1977. So, yeah, <laughs> I, so you've, been, you've been familiar. I, You're familiar. I, I've done some role playing for a while. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. And we've got some other folks that are D&D players and also some game studies uh, friends on the show today to talk through RPGs, race mechanics um, and some inclusivity topics in general in the gaming community. I'll go ahead and let them uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Dave, you want to jump in? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name's David. And uh, I first played second edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons in the late 90s as a elementary school uh, kid and then played 3.5 all through high school and then took a, took a break, but recently got back into it with a group of four new players, which has been a lot of fun. Um, so hopefully I can share some interesting approaches to these specific issues that um, we, we try to tackle. Yeah, and and, uh, and David, I actually know as also as through game studies stuff um, at Duke and UNC, so he's got some expertise there as well. And we've also got it's Michael Michael Chambers, who has been on our show several times at this point. Usually talking about monster stuff, and there are monsters in D and D. So there are monsters in D and D. Yeah, and uh, I'm I'm very happy to be back on the show because I'm not yet finished with my community service. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's great me to be here, uh, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll make sure to record this. Uh, please do. Yeah, definitely. Uh, no, I'm a professor of dramatic literature at the University of California at Santa Cruz, and I've been playing D and D since the mid '80s or early '80s. So, me and Wayne are old, and you two are youngsters. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. So, and I guess as a point of reference, as we're talking about the games, I, I played a lot of the the old games. I haven't played a lot of D and D in the last twenty years, mostly mm-hmm. other systems. Uh, by so, I am not nearly as familiar with ga- specific game mechanics of versions much beyond I, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. Uh, that said, years of working in a comic slash game emporium, I was aware of all that stuff that was coming out and just out of curiosity, always looked through the books. And so I'm aware of a lot of the new races and I've read some articles on, on the stuff we're, we're going to be talking about. So, but uh, game, game mechanics of new stuff, I'm just not nearly as familiar with. Yeah, I, well, and, yeah, and I come at this stuff mostly. I play D, I've been playing D and D for a while now, but I'm mostly, as as listeners probably are aware, I'm mostly a video game person more than a tabletop. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested, especially like, David and Michael, like what your, I guess, like what everyone's response to this announcement was. I mean, it's, I know for me, myself, like I think it's like the changes to how specifically um, they're talking about how how they represent the stereotypically dark skin fantasy races, so like orcs and drow who traditionally have been like chaotic or evil alignments which are generally not cool in D D, um or at least like yeah the the stereotypical like villainous characters tend to align um with racialized characters and right. i'm really glad to see that they're they're rethinking that it seems like really long overdue especially because this is something that's been raised in the community for like at least as long as i've been a part of it um and i also oh, yeah. found like i'd be interested in hearing other people's perspectives on this but especially as like a woman in these circles like 
their claims, which have been coming out a lot, I think, in the last year that they're like always striving for inclusivity seem to me a little like, yeah, I have a lot of side eye at that for Wizards of the Coast in particular. Um, but I'd be curious to know what other people's like perceptions and, and experience with that has been. I'll, I'll jump in. If that's all right, Katya. Yeah, go uh, for it. yeah. So I think that probably we should start by talking about the background of Dungeons and Dragons, where it came from. Um, so uh, your uh, listeners, uh, both of them probably know about um, Gary Gygax, right? Who was mm -hmm. one of the uh, one of the progenitors, uh, one of the devious minds behind the creation of Dungeons and Dragons. And what he was at the time was a war gamer. And he was very interested in battle simulations. And I think they had worked out, he and his buddies had worked out a, a battle simulation for knights in armor so they could, you know, slash away at each other. But he didn't have much of a story background. And um, this was about the same time, I think this is in the 70s, and J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings was enjoying a real cultural moment at the time. And so what they did is they kind of took their system, and overlaid it onto a story that was pretty much, I don't want to say stolen, but I don't know, it, stolen. It's, it's, I think that's, I mean, part of it is also Tolkien, Tolkien and this kind of happened to D&D, &D, become such central tropes for how we think about fantasy and about gaming mm -hmm. that like, uh, they are kind Tolkien. of like the canon. Yeah. Tolkien, Tolkien's influence on uh, both fantasy writing novels and um, and movies and, and comic books and of course on Dungeons and Dragons and other games of that ilk is indelible. I mean, it's absolutely astonishing. And mm -hmm. um, there have been many attempts throughout the past 50 years or so to try to understand where Tolkien had fallen victim to some of his own prejudices, uh, what it was like to grow up, you know, British in the early 20th century and um, having uh, been uh, part of this debilitating, two debilitating world wars against Germans and so on. And um, the kind of prejudices that he grew up with, which made their way into the system. Right. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons initially absorbed all of that without being critical of it at all, because why would they? Right. And so the problem is that with Tolkien, race is extremely important. You know, in in Tolkien's stories, you have elves and men and dwarfs and orcs and halflings and goblins. And you really need to rely on people's race to understand how they're going to behave and why they behave in certain ways that they do. So it is a very, I think, in that way, a very racist document. Um, yeah. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, it's not really racist because none of these characters exist anywhere. But the truth is, is that uh, Jeffrey Weinstock wrote a great article back in 96, I think, and it was called The Alien is Never Innocent. Um, I'll give you a link to that so you can post it in the. Yeah, in please the do. But basically, it's this idea that, you know, it's it, cultural products are never innocent. You, you, it's never just a robot or, or just a uh, just an orc, because you're always going to it's, it's human nature to try and find ways to transpose those concepts onto real world, uh, real world things. And um, unfortunately, we as humans have a tremendous facility for that, uh, which I think has to do with the way that our amygdala works, I think. But um, that aside, uh, it's been very, very difficult for the owners of Dungeons and Dragons to get racism out. I think you're right, Katya. I think that the fact that they're finally doing it is very welcome. But also we have to raise our eyebrows and say, why is it taking you this long to get around yeah. to it? Right. Why is this part of the phenomenon of, of Black Lives Matter and rioting in, in our streets? Uh, why did it take that to get Wizards of the Coast to start paying attention to these very, very important issues, which, as you say, the Twitterverse and the fan universe has been aware of for a long time? And I think that's why I have like this side eye for Wizards of the Coast is I actually don't think that they care um, as a company. Like I my my experience in seeing their responses, like they they said they released a survey shortly after that announcement. It was supposed to be about inclusivity. That was basically I took it. It was like a 45 minute survey. There were no diversity inclusion questions. They were all okay. basically trying to come up with a new product for online, like remote D&D. &D. Um, yeah, I, I think like, that's right. I'm not convinced. Right. <laughs> I, I my initial re reaction would be to situate the Wizards of the Coast response uh, as being of a piece with all these other major corporations um, blacking out their Twitter uh, profile pictures, or I think the the Reddit icon on my phone is now like a darker color. Um, right? It's it's this reappropriation of the language of diversity and inclusion for the sake of an increased or diversified market share. Right. I mean, the fact that I can use the word diversified in the context of of just better profits um, 
I think, uh, speaks to this like uneasy line between good faith and bad faith uh, marketing of, of diversity and inclusion. Unfortunately. Yeah. Cause I think like, I mean, one of the things I've been thinking a lot is that actually, and people were, were calling the, uh, this out when, when Wizards of the Coast made this announcement is that there's so much homebrew content that's been made around this issue, whether it's racial diversity, um, gender diversity, ableism, all kinds of stuff for years. And not only is Wizards of the Coast, like not really seemingly been interested in incorporating any of that, like really extensive work that's been done um outside of things like the dms guild like i think there's this issue of of the D &D community like sometimes either like like and i'm not saying it's like a monolith but i've seen a lot of like really hostile responses to that work which i think like makes it i think one discourages which is the coast and other companies like it from make it doing this work but i think also like allow it like what's the word i'm looking for like enables that ignorance uh, you know, there's a there's a tendency in medieval uh, studies uh, that we find people who are very interested in medieval studies tend to be looking for um, sort of mythic models to underpin their own racism and white supremacy. Sure. And um, and so those kinds of people can get attracted to Dungeons and Dragons for its medieval flavor right? and its its reliance on on history, uh, which it does rely on history quite a bit. Um, and so I don't know because I mean, I don't play with those kinds of people. I haven't played with those kinds of people in a long time. Yeah. And, um, and I don't think I, you know, I would not enjoy it. So there's a, there's this other community though, as you say, uh, Katya, as you pointed out, you know, people who are really into using the platform of Dungeons and Dragons and other role-playing games to explore new identities and to try and reclaim spoiled identities and to to try on completely new outfits of people and, and try to imagine what i'd be like if i were this kind of person yeah well you know one of the things that that has come up on this podcast any number of times is just, you know, part of the, the nature of fiction reading fiction engaging it in any way is that idea of building empathy you that ability to identify with someone who is not me and and the more of that we do hopefully the more empathetic we're able to become and i you know certainly role playing is an extension of that that idea of let me put myself in i'm gonna this is a call back to last week's episode a new fiction suit that allows me to be someone different and and how does that make me more mm -hmm. empathetic to who or whatever that person is um but i think a lot of people are just like i want to be a barbarian with a big fucking ass and they, and they don't really think, and they don't think of it much, much beyond that. You know? uh, and there's, you know, and that should be a legitimate reason to play D and D. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it should know, be fun. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah. But, but I do agree with you that that what we have here is a tool that could potentially be used to expand empathy, to really deepen our sense of connection to one another. Right. Uh, but it, I think it rarely is used for that. Right. I think you have to have a very conscious group of people who are, who have decided overtly to use it for that, for that reason. And I think that, you know, I mean, when I, I remember when I went to a con uh, one time and um, I was sitting across from a guy who was playing a female character and I thought, Oh, that's interesting. You know, he wants to play a female character, but Oh no, we got into this and his female character was an elf wizardess who had huge, huge breasts and a curvy backside and she was barely wearing any kind of clothes at all and she would she would faint at the, at the slightest um yeah uh, you know. i've definitely run into those guys yeah. and i'm like you're, you're not, right you're not you're not trying to put yourself into another person's body you're trying to make yourself into the ideal well, one for you're yourself. Using role play as a way yeah. of like doing fan service right. essentially. Well, he's, he's trying to put himself into someone else's body. It's just not working. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, well, and, and for what purpose? Yeah, like yeah, clear, yeah, clearly not yeah. because he cares about empathizing or exploring no, characters. Yeah. It's because, you know, it's like, like it's, it's fan service. He wants to play as a woman with boobs and basically yeah. like, yeah, it's, it's prurience. It's a way of right. acting out some kind of uh, adolescent puerile fantasy. And I began to realize that it was probably because this guy had actually never met a woman in his entire life. So hmm. that had become pretty clear. <laughs> I think it's more like women, like, I mean, I think that's one of the the things about, I mean, my experience of, I mean, I know we're going to talk about racial mechanics, but I think like, I mean, you know, hashtag white lady, but like, I think that there is some overlap because I like, I walk into game stores, like, okay, so statistically as many women play things like video games and tabletop RPGs as men, if you walk into the average video game store or like, you know, convention or anything, you would not know that. Yeah. 
Um, well, and, and at any one, yeah, like at any at any one time, like half the time. I mean, I think of like you know shops that I've and shops that I think actually do a fairly good job of being inclusive, like ones that I've experienced in North Carolina or other places I've lived. Like I will, you know, I am most of the time the only woman in the room, mm-hmm. other than my immediate friend group. And I, I definitely have had the experience of walking into game shops to play D and D, you know, communal tables. And I, we will be the only women, but you know, my, my, uh, D and D crew is predominantly women, but we'll be the only like women in the, in the group. Mm-hmm. And these spaces are also like very white and, and just, I, like extrapolating I, from that. Like I, I go into any g- new games, g- game community and I am like prepared for somebody to be mm-hmm. awful to well, me. I, I think there's a whole other episode here of, of exactly that. Just how right. th- those spaces have traditionally been such a boys club just because of their origins and, and all the different stuff that that attitude is still there. You know, un- unfortunately it's cliche, but it's true. But so many comic shops and game stores are kind of actively hostile to, to women specifically, um, which, and I, I, I think our store was better than that. I, I would say in the comics division anyway, we were easily, well, I, I, for our over 40 customers, it was predominantly male because those are the guys who've been reading it forever and part of that old school mindset. For our under 40 crowd, it was easily 50-50 male, female, easily. Yeah, well, and like, I think part of it was like, when I went into your, you know, when I went into your shop, Wayne, like, I knew that like, if somebody started being an awful to somebody else, that would not be tolerated and would be kicked out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I think um, the fact that there are, that there is such an equal division of men and women in the gamer community is no thanks to Wizards of the Coast, right? Because there yeah. was a time, and I guess this is back in the days when Dungeons and Dragons was controlled by TSR, uh, which is a different company. Um, but in the 80s, there was a period of time when when there was a real attempt to market geek culture and geek cultural products to women. Um, and I, I show a, a thing in one of my classes where I show video, I mean, um, commercials women playing games like Ms. Pac-Man, you know, that was a specifically designed to get women to play video games. Right. And then they just gave up on it. They just gave up on, and there's some, there are some uh, magazine ads for Dungeons and Dragons that show men and women mm-hmm. playing together, young, young teenagers and teenage boys and girls playing together, but those disappeared. Right. And throughout the nineties, it wasn't a, you didn't get a sense that it was a place that was welcoming to women or to people of color. And funny thing about this new resurrection of Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, I'm thinking, particularly about uh critical role mm-hmm. if you guys, you guys know what critical role is if, yeah and also mm-hmm. the adventure zone a lot of these actual play podcasts yes. yeah yeah, the podcasts, yeah, yeah, where people play Dungeons and Dragons, and Critical Role is a deep favorite of mine. Uh, they're all professional actors, and they really know what they're doing. You know, they're all white, um, so we do have women represented in these in these fora. And you know, Katya, you put on the, on your blog post where you put out the call for this. Mm-hmm. Episode, there's an image of some, I would say, maybe late twenty somethings or early thirty somethings, uh, two men and two women playing Dungeons and Dragons, right? And, mm-hmm. oh, Look, women playing Dungeons and Dragons, but once again, they're all white people, right? So, and I think this goes like I mean, I think one of the things that I think is is that I wanted to think about today is how much of that is the culture of gaming, and how much of that culture of gaming is shaped by the mechanics of the game. Because I think one of the things that I mean, and this is something from game studies we talked about in previous episodes, is that game mechanics kind of define what what kinds of representation, what kinds of actions players are supposed to take within a game. You can obviously play against the game. And I would say that most people who have truly inclusive games of D&D, in order to do that, you have to play against the rules because the rules are yeah. built in a way to discourage inclusivity, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. And, I guess, and, I, and I think, like, Michael, you brought up race, like the race in Tolkien at the beginning. I mean, that became like D&D and Tolkien became archetypes in the fantasy communities, and the gaming communities for how you deal with basically connecting race with characteristics of of gameplay. So for for people who might not be familiar with D&D and with race mechanics and games in general, basically what will happen is when you're making a character, so in this case for D&D, I'm making my character sheet, I'm deciding what my character looks like, what what cool things I can do, all this other stuff um, based off of the game rules. One of the first things I have to decide is what my race is. So for example, I play as a half elf. Um, for my main for my main character and what that gives me is it it assigns a bunch of abilities and characteristics and traits that are inherent to the race of my character nothing to do with background nothing to do with that so just by picking the genetic makeup of my character it's already put my character into a box 
And if my DM isn't willing to let me experiment with that, um, which my personal DM is, but I know a lot of people who are very strict, like by the books, DMs may not. Um, you're kind of locked into what is an inherently racist system, even when it's laudatory, like elves get a lot of positive things attached to them. Orcs, on the other hand, it's almost entirely negative. Same thing with drow, which is a um, dark elves, which even that language is problematic. And I mean, I guess the question is like, can that can those mechanics be saved or are they worth saving? Like, is it worth saving game rules that inherently say like certain races behave in certain ways because i mean i think what Wizards of the coast has proposed or at least what i've seen so far is just not actually re-interrogating those mechanics just changing like making it so orcs and drow have more positive characteristics so i, I, I want to harken back to actually the founding of the game D D as a as a kind of ironic source for why we really shouldn't be too precious with these rules with maintaining them and that is totally um you know the, the so the the like book to read is the 700 plus page uh playing at the world by john peterson um in, which is a, a fantastic cultural kind of prehistory um starting in 19th century kriegspiel um, which was a variant of chess used by prussian military officers in their training all the way up through the, the aforementioned wargaming and then uh there was uh you know the i think it was the one of the earlier Gen Cons at Lake Geneva, where Gary Gygax lived, where Dave Artisan, the other founder, uh, took his game on the road. And his game was uh, itself a variant of Gygax. I believe it was Gygax's own fantastical variant of Chainmail, which was a medieval wargaming game. And Artisan was really the uh, inventor behind a lot of the key mechanics, which really introduced the break between D and D as a tabletop role playing game, emphasis on the role playing from other mm-hmm. wargaming games, um, and the way it was, it became an actual game was that um, because it was on the road, Dave Arneson had to rely, and his group had to rely more so on oral storytelling. And they emphasized language to a degree, which was not actually the case at their normal game gaming table because they couldn't bring all their um, tabletop equipment with them, um, and then. Artisan didn't actually have a set of systematized rules. He was relying on sort of as they went, they would just keep notes and it was sort of a precedent based system. And then Mm -hmm. Gygax systematized it. Right. So I I bring up this story uh, to highlight like how open ended and kind of intrinsically proliferating Dungeons and Dragons has always been from the get go, which isn't to say there aren't uh, conservative reactionary forces in the player base and the designers. Um, But I think like as a game, as like this rational system, um, and now my dissertation is speaking through me, unfortunately, <laughs> for better or worse. Um, right? It's like it is, that's, that's what we're here for. Oh, good, good. It's it's intended to be dispersed, um, mm-hmm. and and I think I, I really like this resonance between this uh, origin story and the role that actual play podcasts have played have played in the revival and really in the foregrounding of a diversity of kinds of people who like to play these games. Um, there, there's a, a blog post on, I think, the Mary Sue about uh, the Adventure Zone, uh, which is four um, three brothers and a dad, all white, heterosexual males in West Virginia. And like one of them plays as um, as a gay wizard. And like this, I, I guess this was huge for a lot of people listening. Um, mm-hmm. And and so like, I, I think hopefully that's a useful kind of a grounding position in response to what are no doubt reactionary trends on Twitter and in certain elements of the fan base who will say, who will like themselves refer to the way the game has always been, or you can't change it when in fact, like the game is itself a change, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. So, so I, it's I often pushed by players too. I, yes. think I mean, I think that's the interesting thing is like, I, I like, I saw a few like, like think pieces where people were like, oh, the Wizards of the Coast is really being progressive on this. I'm like, actually, they're following their players. I, like, know, that's really true. I mean, but to underscore that, David, in, in first edition, uh, men and males and females of different species had different stats. Mm-hmm. So it just goes to show you, you know, that women were not as strong as men and, and not as constitutional. I don't know what the adjective is for that. Constitutional? That's you not don't have high constitution oh, scores. I didn't have a high constitution. They weren't as burly as men. You know, and sure. so, and then there were all these charts. I mean, that was the, that was the, the, the death of, uh, you know, the, um, the horror of first edition was that there was a chart for everything. Yeah. And mm. if you wanted to walk across the street, you had to roll on the walking across the street table. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> which is on page 96, nowhere near any of the other charts. Right? Or any it's, other thing it's, you yeah. Right. <laughs> I've never played you know. that edition, and but I've seen the handbooks, and I I don't you you had to be committed. Yeah, I don't know how we ever did it in tenth grade. I really don't. Oh, I do. I totally do because there is this um, there's an aspect of nerddom where we think that encyclopedic yeah. understanding of rules is the same thing as knowledge and wisdom. Yes. You know? and so, <laughs> So it attracts a certain type of person. So do comic books and so do any other sure. form of, of geek culture, you know. Um, and I try to tell my students that's the beginning of wisdom, not the end. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's why you see all these like like this backlash on D&D. Like one of the and, and I think that's true of like geek culture in general. Like I'm not just singling out the gaming community or D&D in particular. Like the one that came to it was is I've been watching on Twitter most recently, um, which uh, David and I actually have talked about a little bit. But there was an artist um, at Mustang Art on um, on Twitter who released a combat wheelchair. So yes. they're I'm, a. Uh, so glad you brought that up. Yeah, they're yes. they're a, they're a um, disability advocate um, and game developer. So they should they make a lot of um, homebrew content uh, to basically diversify D and D and I believe other tabletop RPGs. Um, but I'm so, I'm so glad you brought that up, Katya, because my background is also in disability studies. Oh, cool. And, right on. Um, and I am one of those DMs who will just mess with the rules if that wasn't clear already. And yeah. I have a I have a, a, a gamer, one of at my table, one of the few men, one of the few white men at my table. My table is mostly women of color, uh, I'm very, which I'm very thankful for. But one of the few white men at my table is also someone who is severely disabled, physically disabled. And he asked if he could play a physically disabled character in the story. And we hit up against the rules. And there was just really it was really very, very, very difficult to do that because it's the superhero complex right everybody in all the characters are supposed to be super heroic right and so what if you want to play a character who can't walk for instance right and so how do you how do you work around that and we wound up breaking some rules and resetting them in interesting ways so we gave him a, a lizard that that he can ride around you know um it's yeah you're, and you're absolutely right it is it is the game itself is inherently designed to sort of keep us away from that kind of experimentation. But to return to your other question, is it worth rehabilitating it? Right. I think that's a really interesting question that you asked, Katya. Um, well, I think that the interesting thing about the combat wheelchair is I think it exposed for a lot of people like what the experience of gaming, if you weren't, if you didn't fit the stereotype of who a gamer was supposed to be, was really like, because basically this particular artist and creator, like her, her their uh, tagline now says the ruiner of D&D because they got so much backlash from the community. Uh -huh. It was I like like I I have never in a very long time wanted to throw all of my D and D stuff out and like literally light it on fire after this, but it was like the amount of hashtag like serious gamers that came out and basically said like that this was an antithetical to D and D that this was ruining the game because how could you possibly put a wheelchair into a fantasy game and it's like no one's <laughs> making you use this content. Also, like, and I think to go back to the idea of like the people mistaking encyclopedic knowledge for any kind of like what? being a quote unquote real gamer, because like I think there's like the subset of 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 gamers that get so precious about it that if you if you touch their canon, they just like freak out. And unfortunately, they're some of the most vocal people yeah. in the gaming community. It just boggles me how these people who want to live in these grand imaginary worlds right. uh, can't imagine something like that. It's like you can you can accept the 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 conventional reality of a five headed dragon queen from hell, but yeah. not not a wheelchair. Yeah, and I, you know I, it's true that wheelchairs are not you know period, but uh, they could be. Yeah, <laughs> neither are, neither are bombs and guns, but we're great. Right. Right. right, and I think these that's are like dragons here right. in terms of period. They're dragons, yeah. Just because it has like period. a historical aesthetic, I mean, the same could be said of Tolkien. It's like it has a historical aesthetic, it has a historical referent. But as soon as you put hobbits and dragons right. in it, it it's a different thing. So it's like, what, 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 what? Like, you know, who, who are you people? <laughs> Do you hear yourself? <laughs> Yeah. Well, in, in 2013, N.K. Jemison, are you guys familiar yeah. with mm -hmm. N.K. Jemison? was one of the great fantasy writers of our day. Uh, she put a she had a blog post up on her blog back in 2013 that says that she got an email from a reader that said, when are you going to write some real fantasy, you know, with orcs? Um, <laughs> She starts talking about orcs and um, she has it's a wonderful, wonderful essay where basically she says, I am never going to write fantasy with orcs in it, you know, and the reason why is because I'm looking at all of these 
real world connections. Uh, she says orcs are fruit of the poison vine that is human fear of the other. And she basically is saying, look, I, I just feel like the whole concept of orcs is irredeemable. She literally says that irredeemable, right? Mm -hmm. I think that is a very good point. I mean, I'm such a huge fan of N.K. Jemison and, and her work. Um, but at the same time, I love orcs. I love Dungeons and Dragons. I, I recognize that it's got problems with race. It's got problems with gender. It's got problems with ability. But all of those things are, you know, I paid my money. I bought the book. I can do whatever the hell I want with it. And I can screw with the rules. I can turn them upside down. I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. It's only limited by my imagination. And mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons taught me to love comparative literature. It taught me to love mythology. It taught me to love history. And all of those things are a big part of who I am now, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to do the work. And it is a lot of work. I don't disagree with N.K. Jemison. It is a lot of work to be able to reclaim the drow, to reclaim the orc, uh, to reclaim the dragonborn, you know, in a way that that is meaningful and that can give uh, our players opportunities to explore these very important issues in this very powerful, possibly potentially powerful setting. Yeah. There, and there's a couple of ways I'd like to bring up um, on how to do that work at the table with your fellow players. Um, there, there was a commenter on the, on the podcast blog to, mm -hmm. in response to Katya and, and they were talking about um, goblins that were raiding a local human village um, and they weren't doing it because goblins are in inherently evil, right? But rather because there was food scarcity. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is to say, like, to think through the actual material motivations of the various player, uh, player and non-player characters, um, you know, as opposed to just doing the lazy thing, which is relying on bioessentialism um, and, and, and extending that Tolkien universe. Um, the other one is a piece of advice that Austin Walker, who he runs a game, uh, actual play podcast called Friends at the Table, which is one of the most incredible like podcasts I've ever heard. It's, I mean, the amount of imagination is just staggering to me. I, I like cannot imagine trying to play with them. Um, <laughs> um, and, and they tend to play Dungeon World and other Powered by the Apocalypse systems, which are much more narratively focused. Um, but, but something he says uh, to creative writers in particular is if you're trying to write a character or role play a character that is of an identity other than your own, that the simplest way to um, avoid falling into various uh, stereotypical traps is to just depict more than one character, <laughs> mm -hmm. which, which is simple advice, but it's so true um, because it's, you know, it's not only you're going to avoid of avoid the trap of having a tokenized identity or be more likely to avoid it, but you're getting closer to the reality of identity, which is difference. And I think it's also like researching what you're trying to represent. I think like one of the really cool points that came up um, and a lot of discussion around the combat wheelchair was like, hey, if you're going to play a disabled player and you are not yourself disabled IRL, uh, here's a bunch of things you need to think about. I mean, I think like, like Michael, your point about the, the player that tried to be a lady and kind of got, right. fucked it up. Like you actually have to think about what it means. I've definitely seen, you know, white players play characters of color and like do a kind of like blackface kind of thing with it. And thankfully I've always yeah. been in groups where people call that out and are basically like, Hey, if you're going to play this character, you need to fix it. Um, yeah. Because I think, because I think like, even though, I mean, and I think it goes to the point of like, I'm interested to see what the Wizards of Coast end up doing. And I'm interested to see how the community responds to it because I think as dangerous as excluding this kind of representation is in many ways, including it, but doing it really harmfully. And I think that's been a really interesting conversation among game studies in general is like, how do you represent race? When do you represent race? Because I think we're all kind of saying it's like role playing and playing and games can be a really powerful way to interrogate our, our misconceptions, our stereotypes, our beliefs. But there's both like, you have to do it well, but I think there's also the problem is like, well, then how do you do it in a way that also isn't alienating for players like other players as well? Absolutely. And also, like, how can you do it in a way that somehow uh, this is going to be hard to hard to get this point across, but somehow takes the racial diversity of Dungeons and Dragons and turns it into an asset right, instead of a problem? Yeah. And 
And I think that, so there's a wonderful game designer, uh, uh, who has a blog. His name is James Mendez Hodes. I think I'm saying that last name correctly. James Mendez Hodes, H-O-D-E-S. He's got a blog. And in June of last year, he wrote an essay called Orcs, Britons, and the Marshall Race Myth. And he really gets into this where he really, like me, he loves to play orcs. He, he thinks orcs are great. And so he wants to reclaim uh, them from their racial stereotypes. And he actually comes up with some very, really exciting ways about how to do that, right? It's not easy. But uh, you, you, this is what he recommends is number one, center their stories, allow orcs to star in the narrative mm -hmm. as main player, main characters or player characters, give them traits and likability, right? Uh, diversify orcish culture so that you say that like not every, um, not every orc is the same kind of, you know, eats the same kind of cuisine or wears the same kind of clothing or speaks the same kind of language. Uh, says like lean into the real world cultural signifiers, right? So, so Tolkien thought of orcs as being like Mongols, like Mongoloid peoples. And so, all right, make them nomadic with tents and herds of livestock and gigantic fluffy dogs and make them throat singers, right? <laughs> you know, so, and also most importantly is a shoe ability score modifiers so that you don't mm -hmm. develop ability scores based on your race, but instead based on your class. And I think that uh, Wizards is going to do this with their next product, which is, I think, called Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Mm -hmm. I'm, I read an article about that, and it looks like that's what they're going to do. They're going to they're going to take away uh, ability score modifiers based on your race and make them based on your class, which is a good move. Yeah. Yeah. I, at my table, I just had everyone do they, they could be whatever race you know, or species they wanted, but they could pick any of the ability scores from any of the races. And I reckon mm -hmm. they were they were all new players. So I said, just go with the half elf because I think it's the most generous and flexible. Mm -hmm. um, That's one yeah. of the reasons why I'm a half elf. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. And, and by the way, we had the um, Kaya, you mentioned the um, one of your characters is being a barbarian gnome with an axe bigger than her. Uh, we definitely had uh, Mulva, a gnome who was by by in a way like five points more strength than the rest of the players, which included a, a barbarian who was quite weak. So. I think that's that's part of the fun. <laughs> There's something yeah, wrong with that. Yeah, it makes for better gameplay. Like yeah, I remember right. like in in my actually my 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 little gnome barbarian who is also on the very small end of gnomes but has a battle axe. Uh one of our favorite <laughs> things is that it, I have the highest strength and constitution scores in the party despite the fact that there's a 6 foot tall like demon guy. Yeah. And so routinely we get to do like all kinds of fun gameplay thing where like everyone's focused on him and he's being the intimidating one when in fact I'm the one that's about to take everyone out at the knees. Um, yeah. And I think like, cool. yeah. Like and, cool. and you get to do so many cool, I think there's so much more opportunities for really interesting storytelling um, when you play against like, not even as I play against type, but play with types like that. I mean, I know one of the most interesting character, like story arcs that my, one of my DMs wrote was, we basically did like an entire year out of game, not in game, like fighting in an inter like inter like uh, orc war and basically figuring out like, oh, how do we deal with one of like one of our party members is an orc. And it's like, oh, how do we as a party, none of whom are orcs now, like try and help somebody in our party deal with the fact that their entire culture is currently fragmenting because of like uh, clan conflict. And that's, that's it was awesome. fascinating. Yeah. It was fascinating. Yeah. And I think my DM did a really good job. And I think people and it was also really cool because like I think we all learned a different version. Like we it was it was a lot of it was a lot of lore because there was a lot of in-game, very deep critical thinking about what it meant to be involved in like conflict and what it meant to be like involved in a conflict on behalf of someone whose culture you don't share. And I think it was like it was a very cool game to play and I think a very insightful one too. Yeah, and I, I lots of gaming groups just don't get don't get that uh, that deep with their, their thinking, the way they approach things. I, I, I will say, you know, one of the reasons I, I've been drawn toward other role playing games and, and kind of not played a lot of D and D in the last twenty years or so is the limitations of that. I felt like I had played every variation. Oh, I've been an orc barbarian. Oh, I've been mm -hmm. a half elf thief. You know, and just you know, anytime someone would bring it up and to roll up a character, I just found myself. I've done this. Mm -hmm. And some of that is because of the built-in limitations of, of the system. And, and I've traditionally played with groups that it's much more about character and storytelling than it is the charts on page 97, you know? <laughs> so, so, so there's always been a lot Same. of allowance for that variation. But I still just found myself not very interested in D&D &D worlds because of that. Just that there's so much limitation of, of what I can make these characters under under the rules. 
even in, in very open-minded playing groups. And maybe that's more my lack of imagination than anything else. But, but I it, think it, it's part of why I'm, I, I've kind of moved away from D&D as opposed mm-hmm. to other systems. But I think you're right, Wayne. I mean, I think that, that if, if we as gamers find our own imaginations limited by the imaginations of the people who produce you know, yeah. the official stuff, then we're pretty poor gamers. And, I, and I'm probably going to and i didn't mean to cast an aspersion on you i was just saying that no 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 no. you you know better i i do i do (laughs) jeez wayne jeez falling down listen i've seen wayne play games i've seen him play he he is really funny to play with he's a lot to play with um but uh I forgot what I was going to say. I, I, I am clever and unpredictable. He's clever and unpredictable, which is a, the bane of all. <laughs> I will say this, that, that I'm sure, you know, based on the, on the response from the chats, that even in this audience to this Vox Populorum, which, as we all know, that the, the, the listeners of Vox Populorum are the smartest people in the world. I mean, that is best, best podcast ever. Yeah, that's why I was. <laughs> was scientifically <laughs> determined by a study at Harvard last year that, that <laughs> Vox Populorum listeners are the smartest people in the world. But, you know... Don't tell Mav. Yeah. Don't go to his yeah. head. <laughs> no, that's why I saved that for, for this. But if people are saying, like, well, that's not how I want to play the game. You know, I want to play the game the old way. I want to play it the racist way. I want to play it the sexist, homophobic, ableist way. Now, my response to that is twofold. Number one, you're free to do that. You paid the money to, to buy the materials. You can play however you want. But number two, I also want to say, fuck you, because you're not paying, <laughs> you're not paying any attention to what the hell is going on in the world around you. And if you yeah. uh, if you are the kind of person who thinks that that's not your responsibility to deal with, then you're part of the problem, Jack. It is actually it reminds me, which this is uh, one of the funniest things I've ever experienced, especially in like lady lady gamer land. <laughs> I don't know if this happens in other other places, but especially when we we end up going out on like you know first and second dates and find out that guys play D anD D, we immediately are like, okay, who are your characters? How do you play them? Because honestly, I if you play D anD D like a jerk, I know that you are not a person I I want to be around. Yeah, I think, I, like uh, one of the things I really enjoy about like role playing games is you get to know people in a way you don't in your every everyday life. Yep. Which is usually when you're playing with people that you like love and care about is an awesome experience. I've also been involved in like, you know, going to games where I don't know people, especially ones where I just go up shop to shop, you know, maybe I know the DM, but otherwise it's just people from the shop. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, nope. I'm glad to know that this is just a person I give a wide berth from here on out. Yeah. I'm very lucky that one of one of the people in my gaming group is a, a, a trans woman and she is a dungeon master and she put together a Planescape game for us, which is a, 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 a game where you jump from dimensions, different forms of reality to another. It's really fun. Uh, and she created a sort of trans utopia for us to play in. And as a result, for the very first time ever in my life, I played a character who was bisexual. I've never done that before. I never felt safe to do that anywhere. I'm doing that in the Marvel role playing game that I've been doing for three years. Bisexual Marvel character? Yeah. Ah! I totally heard marble character and I thought no, for a second no, no, that no, you no. started actually no, finally no. watching. Nope, nope. Old, old school marble superheroes role playing game. I'm, I'm going to say it's been like five minutes before somebody told a stupid joke. So, yeah. <laughs> hey man, Marble, yeah, marble League, if Marble League ever ceases to be an, an ongoing threat in this show, I'll be very sad. Well, we haven't mentioned mm-hmm. Riverdale this time either, so I got to get yeah, that. Yeah, but that's it. That's it. That's isn't that like a, that's like that's, that's more, that's more teasing. Yeah, that's teasing yeah. more than anything else. So. Yeah, that's that's not, <laughs> that's not our thing because you and I don't actually <laughs> care about those things as much. I thought for once we were going to get through. I thought we were going to get through an entire session of Vox Popularum without talking about Riverdale. Just no, for- no, 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 not gonna no. Happen. Sorry, we have to think about like if, if there's ever an opportunity for merch. Yeah, probably like right. ten million years from now, but we have yeah. to think about it. Yeah, right. Sorry, David, you were gonna say. <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to be clear that I will fuck with some Archie, you know, some yeah. and gargoyles. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> design a Riverdale role playing game. <laughs> hey, man, it's it, it's probably if it hasn't happened already, it's probably on its way. I, yeah. I just assume that anything that I could po- possibly think of is probably exists somewhere on the internet. Maybe it exists yeah. on a part of the internet I haven't found yet, but it exists. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd, be, I'd be surprised if there's, I'd be surprised if there's not something based on the Archie comics, if nothing else. And actually, to that point, I was thinking about this the other day and talking with some other other gamer folks in my life because I don't play a lot of RPGs outside of uh, or tabletop RPGs, at least outside of D&D, um, because 
it already consumes enough of my gaming life. Um, I just want to say, I, I just, I just did a real quick look for uh, Riverdale role play. Uh, oh and there, there's hundreds. Yeah, so, that sounds yeah. right. Uh, uh, missed the boat, Mav. <laughs> Hi, it's Mav from the future of this episode. I'm not even on the show today, but I still have to edit them. And imagine my surprise when this conversation came up. If you're going to mention a Riverdale role-playing game, you know that's going to send me down a rabbit hole where I spend like an hour searching for it. As far as I can tell, there is no official Riverdale role-playing game per se. Some people have come up with their own tiny little rules. Most people who have wanted to play seem to suggest one of two games, School Days or Bubble Gum Shoes, both of which are linked in the show notes. Now I'm going to have to buy them and play. Oh, well. Now, back to the show. I don't play a lot of other tabletops, but like I think one of the interesting things about D&D, and I think this is true of, I think, any cultural product. I mean, this is definitely true of the history of science fiction and a lot of other literary you know, genres. The kind of gaps where D&D didn't, I guess, like make home runs, I guess, for lack of a better term. I mean, where it felt fell down in representation or design, like opened up a lot of places for other games to innovate and do really cool things. Mm-hmm. Like I know from just talking around, like a lot of people have said that like the way that representation works and things like Pathfinder and other RPGs that they've been working, they've been they've been playing is a lot better because they could respond. They saw what people were doing with D and D, especially what people were were turning D and D into with homebrew, and we're like, hey, why don't we just build a game around this? I, I think Katja has solved ro- role playing games. <laughs> yeah, well, you fixed it. I mean, just make good things, and also don't be shitty when yeah. people make cool stuff. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the, like. I mean, I think I, that the the thing is, it's like if if someone sees if someone makes something like a homebrew thing that is trying to like improve upon a game that they care about, because I think that's the thing that gets lost in all these debates about what D and D or other tabletop RPGs should and shouldn't have, or what should and shouldn't be played. It's like these are people that are like taking a game that they care about and trying to make them better. Like it's not like people are trying to like ruin your game. It's like people like making homebrew content takes a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And like when people are taking time to do that, they're not trying to ruin D&D. It's because they play D&D all the time. They care about it. It's a big part of their experience of the gaming community or whatever. It's a big source of like self-expression. It's like, let them do your thing and listen to them. Like, I think like I learned so much from following that combat wheelchair threads on, on Twitter. I mean, if you ignore the, you know, troll people. Um, which maybe this episode is yeah, maybe no, we, let, we let, need a better better word yeah, than trolls. Say, let's, let's not disparage trolls. <laughs> That's true. Let's not. Hashtag not all trolls, you know. <laughs> yeah, not all trolls. Not all trolls. Just the ones on the internet. Um, but like that aside, I think people had some really insightful conversations and a lot of like sharing of tools of like here's how to make a more inclusive game. Here's how to avoid like really important like in game triggers for people who have you know PTSD or mental health stuff going on. And I think it was like I, I hope something really positive comes out of it from the gaming community. Um, out of that conversation and a lot of the ones like it. I know, I know that it, I know that it is. I know that there are positive things coming out of it because my group, uh, my, my total group is about 25 people. We don't all play at the same time. But it's we, a lot. It's a lot. It's a big group, right? We don't all play at the same time. But, um, and there are, and these are people from very diverse backgrounds with very diverse opinions. A lot of them are professional scholars, you know, and, and college professors, and they're not going to let me get away with anything, you know, out of ignorance or, or stupidity. They're not going to let me get away. So, and that's great. Uh, For instance, we have a rule where everybody has a little, um, a little piece of paper with an X drawn on it that they keep in front of them. And if something happens, Mm -hmm. if something happens in the game that they feel triggered about, they just put the X down in the middle of the table. And then we immediately, nobody says, sorry, nobody tries to figure, you know, we don't, don't challenge or anything. We just go back and fix it and just move on. Because the Mm -hmm. point is for everybody to have fun. Mm -hmm. That's the point, you (laughs) troll. For all the people complaining about realism, it's like the whole point of playing the game is like, yes, we can't go back in the past and fix things that we screwed up. But in D&D, you can. Yeah. You can. You can come back from the dead. You could play an orc (laughs) who loves... Uh, music and and literature. You can or do a barbarian it. that enjoys pink bunnies. That's yeah, right. Yeah. There's been similar um, reactions in video games. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's Creative Assembly, which does the Total War games. Mm-hmm. Uh, in their Rome iteration, they they had like a, a higher than historically accurate chance of you having a woman general, and people were freaking out, and they're like. Fuck off! It's a video game, and like, like yeah, play a different like, game if you don't like. Like, what? What is the problem? Yeah. <laughs> like, why are you like 
forcing yourself to just rely on what you think was the case when when we're like creating a, new things. Well, and, and there's there's a rigidity to that type of thinking, and I, I think that that's at the core of a lot of problems, not just with this topic, but with most topics, is that lack of fluidity in your ability to perceive the world around you or, or do anything different. It, it's anti-imagination, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, there are people who just aren't very imaginative, and, and people who are just this is the way things are, and can't can't move beyond that. And some of that just boils down to personality and experience and whatever. But I don't know that many of those people really engage in fantasy role playing anyway, because it seems antithetical to the way they think. <laughs> but I I could be wrong. There's obviously a bunch of rigid people on uh, on message boards and D and D groups and that sort of thing. So when I when I meet a troll online, I always think. How do, how do you have any friends at all? You know, <laughs> how does anybody put up with you? But I mean, I think it's actually worse. I think it's worse than that. Did we talk about the last time I was on? Did we talk about this concept called the triumph of the geeks? If we didn't go know. ahead and rehash. Yeah, yeah feel free. Because none of us can remember anything we talked about. Right. In the past. I mean, a hundred and something episodes. It's yeah. blurring together, man. All the, all the, drug, all the drugs and, and booze that you guys do. I understand. So <laughs> no, that, that's, that's the other thing my Marvel character does. So <laughs> Drugs and booze. Right. So um, this is for kids, right? This podcast. OK, so. Yeah, the, sure. Kids at heart. Uh, right. the adult children. So I'll plug a book that I have that's coming out this year called Systemic Dramaturgy from Zayami to the Legend of Zelda. It's coming out from Southern Illinois University Press, uh, I think, in the fall. I hope in the fall. And uh, I have a chapter in here on Gamergate and what what went down during Gamergate. Uh, which mm -hmm. if if people don't know what that is, then that's astonishing because it was a global phenomenon of harassment and uh, vilification and doxing of women and girls uh, that took place over the whole world. And it's still taking place. And it took place before officially 2014 is when it was first uh, sort of identified. It hasn't stopped. Um, it's just part of the gamer world now, you know, is this, this, uh, horrifying doxing and vilification. And in my, my own research, I trace this back to this notion that when I was a kid and when Wayne was a kid, long before any of you two were children, back in the latter half of the bronze age, we believed we were, we, we were geeks and we used to get beat up for it all the time. Right, Wayne? I mean, like on the playground and stuff. Right. So you didn't tell people that you played Dungeons and Dragons. It was a, it wasn't something that you went on the internet and bragged about. Not that we had the internet, but the internet actually has changed things. It's made communities easier to find. And there's a sense that geek culture, which is triumphant right now. I mean, the biggest selling movies are superhero movies and Dungeons and yeah. Dragons is really enjoying a huge moment and geek culture is really dominant in culture right now. And so the idea is that if anybody comes along and says, Hey, you're doing it wrong. Or, Hey, have you considered that way you're doing it is kind of racist or sexist or homophobic? It feels like persecution again. It feels like the persecution of the geek, even though it's other geeks who are doing it. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea is that no matter how badly you react to this, no matter how vicious and indecent and stupid and racist and homophobic and sexist your reaction is, it's justified because you're protecting geek culture. Right? And so I think part bad. of it is because when people respond that way, they don't see the person who's pointing that out as, a, as part of that culture. I mean, right. like I am someone who has an entire dissertation on video games and has been playing video games since I was roughly seven years old. I can probably I cannot begin to count the number of times that like people have done the like, oh, you can't possibly be a quote unquote real gamer. I don't even know what that statement means. As far as I'm concerned, if you play video games and you enjoy them and you like talking about them with other people, you're a gamer and you're part of this community. Like and yeah. I think it's like and I, and I see that a lot, especially I mean, like in the in the arguments about what isn't isn't OK off quote unquote, OK for D&D. &D, like it's a lot of people saying like, oh, well, you don't actually play D&D &D to people who clearly play D&D &D because their entire Twitter feed is mainly D&D &D and other <laughs> tabletop RPGs. And uh, I mean, you know, Voltaire, or was it Lessing, said that criticism is an act of love. Sure. So I, I just don't think that the geek community like sees it that way. And they think uh, like, and I say they, I'm talking about the like hashtag serious gamer, like those guys, not the actual gaming community. Um, I wish that this was, this phenomenon was restricted to the gaming community, but it's not uh, a couple no. of years ago. A couple years ago, my friends, uh, some friends of mine um, at the, at uh, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival began a process of 
of sort of translating Shakespeare into more modern language so that it could be more easily understood. And oh my God, did they get attacked. They got flamed and doxxed and terrible things from the traditional Shakespeare's who said, you're ruining Shakespeare. And when I was asked to comment on it, I said, how is this erasing the original Shakespeare from the first folio? It's not, it, you know, you're just trying to make it more available to a wider audience. Nobody's taking anything away from you where they're adding. Something. But that's not the mindset. The mindset is, oh, no, you're ruining this thing, which mm -hmm. I've devoted my life to and I love. Well, so. And, and that, that's being being the comics guy. Every time there's a reboot whatever just you know they, they cry you're not my batman has just become the rallying cry of any time they right. does something they do and it is and, and we've done multiple episodes that that deal with that sort of thing that mindset of the ownership that that fans take of that thing by which they love and it, but it's so it's so smothering like they they can't allow people to love this thing in a different way than the way they do and it's, uh, it's, it's problematic it's and like David pointed out earlier, you know, it's like David pointed out earlier where he said that the, the game has always changed, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and 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 every group have, finds its own its own way of doing that. I mean, I have people I've game with consistently for years, but you know, at any given moment, I, I find myself in a game with some new people I haven't gamed with before, and it changes the experience, and that's part of the fun of it. I have also like you, like you, Kai. Yeah, I, I haven't done as much of going to game conventions and whatever, but I've been in situations where I've sat down with a group of people that I don't know well at all to game with and very quickly have that realization. These are not people I'd want to game with regularly. <laughs> yeah. Just their, their approach to it. The, more often than not for me, there's a rigidity to it, to the rule system, the, the game Nazis kind of thing. Um, we had an experience years ago. We were playing Shadowrun. Uh, Michael, you remember Sean Williams? We did a D&D. &D of course I do, yeah. And Sean ran a really remarkable Shadowrun campaign, but he was running two groups at the same time in the same world. He had set it in, in Shadowrun Pittsburgh, um, and he was running two different groups. And our group was all actors and artists and creative people, and it was all about story and character. And the other group were all kind of rules Nazis, um, and, and it was a much more precise game and, and tables and charts and that sort of thing. And he built to a group session where both groups were on the same run, and it was a disaster. Uh, it just didn't. And, and Sean was able to switch his mindset for both. You know, as a game master, he was really good at doing both. But when we got together, just the playing styles and the way we had played up until that point was just so in opposition that it just didn't work very well at all. And that was just insightful in, in terms of here's one person running two groups in the same world. Just how different those worlds were. What we got to do on this podcast is play a game, a one shot, and just with the four of us and just try to do something that that exemplifies the kind of gaming that we think is cool so that other people can see how fun it is. Yeah, I, I think the live role playing thing could, could be a lot of fun. Yeah. So, so you, get on, you, you get on that, Michael. Yeah, I, I wrote an adventure called Triumph of the Goblins, where everybody's a goblin. You, I remember us talking about that <laughs> a couple, couple years ago. Yeah, we could we could play that one. <laughs> Uh, I'll just need to work on my goblin voice for a couple of weeks. <laughs> oh boy! Yeah, just like just just get really gravelly, but also high pitched simultaneously. For some yeah. reason, that's the goblin voice in my head. <laughs> yeah, gravelly and high, that's right. You know. <laughs> so chase the up, but also helium. Colonization <laughs> is always a violent phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. You know, I think actually my. My character will have had um, some kind of like arcanically touched uh, grasshopper accidentally fly into his vocal cords. And now he go. speaks with a low, smooth voice. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> I love that. I, I wish I was one of those people that was committed enough to voice act for an entire session of D&D. &D. I am not. Oh. I just, nope, nope, just my, nope, my vocal brain does not do that. <laughs> I like to play with actors, you know, people who are trained as actors because they're really good at improvisation and, and <laughs> space for other people and different voices and languages. It's it's a lot of fun. Well, <laughs> really well. Matter, what we have solved is that people should play games and not be awful about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Do the work. <laughs> First, don't be shitty. It's not that hard. <laughs> So, so yeah, so, okay, so maybe we'll resolve something this time. You know, sometimes we, we resolve a little bit. It's usually it's just like, bit. I feel like, I feel like this, the only thing we ever solved on Vox Popcast is just don't be an awful person and yeah. listen to other people 
Yeah. And in our previous yeah. episode, we did. I was listening back to it uh, earlier this week, and the and the whole "Don't be a eugenicist," which I feel like carries <laughs> over to this episode. Although we won't go into that. Yeah, just just in, <laughs> just, just, just in general, good life. I still don't really advice. understand how we got onto eugenics on that podcast. Yeah, I don't, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> I uh, that's, that's worth repeating. You know that it's it's not good to be a eugenicist. I yeah, I, 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 I want to stand behind that. I, I think I, generally, as a people, that that just should be a, that. Should that should be an unstated just like that it's not a thing that you do but yeah, that works for orcs as well that does work for orcs as well and drow so <laughs> <laughs> well uh yeah i want to thank our guests um to for joining us today and ask you to plug anything you have so david do you have anything um you would like to plug today sure uh you're welcome to check out my website davidrambo.org um, I have some academic publications coming out later about games and mechanical keyboards, but those are still forthcoming. Um, so, but yeah, that, that's it. I this was a really wonderful experience. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, thanks, David. Awesome. And, and, thanks for joining us. And D- David uh, admitted to us before we started recording that this is his first appearance on a podcast ever. So, congratulations, David. So, Yay. 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 yeah, I don't I'm, know I'm what kind of accomplishment. <laughs> that's that is what that indicates. Yeah, that's yeah, no, podcast in our thirties. Yeah, no, no yeah. podcast shaming here. Though, so. no. <laughs> well, you're always you're always welcome back to talk about. Yeah, yeah you were great. Thank you, David. Thanks, um, and thanks for joining us, uh, Michael. You are old hat at this. Do you have anything you'd like to share? Yeah. So uh, even though every time I come on this podcast, I kick myself when I get to this point because I'm not really on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me at Notorious PhD on Twitter, but um, you won't get much out of that. Um, apart That's from like that, my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I put a. Uh, I've got, like I said, I have a book coming out on dramaturgy and uh, new media, which is going to be the first book that talks about dramaturgy and and video games, dramaturgy and role playing games. So it is apropos to this. Yeah, if you have a link on that, please send it. Not yet. Okay. So I have very little to offer you in terms of my social media presence. Okay. We'll just, you know, we'll put a note out to the universe of Google this soon. Uh, if you Google my name, it'll come up along with some ugly pictures of me. <laughs> I think that's the universal condition of everyone who was on the internet. Some like w- once MySpace became a thing. Yeah. The, the things that show up when you Google my name, I'm just like, I don't. Wh- how does the internet still have pictures of me from middle school? <laughs> <laughs> what? Who? Uh, what about you, Wayne? Uh, I have nothing new this week. My my, I'm still doing photos on Instagram. So if you want to follow that, uh, Tech Rock 2012 at Instagram. Um, that's that's the only real new thing I have out there. Same. You can, as always, find me on Instagram. It's mainly sewing stuff. Although we have some fashion history and sewing politics uh, episodes coming up, so you know you can go study up, I guess. Uh, but you can find me at just that nerd kid on Instagram. You can also follow the show at voxpopcast.com, our blog, where we share posts on upcoming episodes. So you can join the conversation and maybe get tapped to be a guest. Um, you can follow the show on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, always at Vox Popcast. We're also on the YouTubes now um, and would really appreciate your follows there as we try and build that up. Mav will be especially indebted to you um, because if I didn't mention this, he would probably reach through the internet and just be very sad. Just be very sad. He's doing it to me. It's happening. (laughs) Uh, As always, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. Please leave us a review, especially on iTunes. It helps, you know, boost the algorithms a little bit um, and brings new folks to the show, which we're massively appreciated appreciative for words are difficult on a Saturday. Uh, And thanks again to everybody um, on our panel for coming to chat today. And thank you for listening. Oh, and Uh, and, and thanks to thought form music for our epic theme song playing ever so epically out. I believe is the way Matt puts it. So I believe that is. (laughs) All right. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Your dungeon master has placed you in a dreadfully precarious position. You're playing the most phenomenal game ever created. Your skin grows cold from your first glimpse of the enormous beast. It's a product of your imagination. <laughs>